That's life, right? Well, this next one is for you. All you lost souls racing down that long road to redemption and all you sinners running from your past but heading straight into that pit of darkness up ahead. We're all on the same endless highway, the one with no name and no exits, looking for a way out of tonight and into tomorrow. Well, they're gonna try to stop you, but you gotta say fuck it and keep moving, because this is your highway, and tonight might just be the night you finally outrun those wicked demons once and for all. And I'll be right here with you, making sure you get where you're going. Welcome to this week's episode of Two Guys and Some Horror. This week we're doing things a little bit differently, so... We actually had a listener request um, from a conversation. Uh, I believe I talked about it a little bit last week. Um, the user on Twitter is at Hot Crack Rat. Um, and she asked us kind of in a weird conversation her and I were having about gory movies because I asked her what her favorite genre was. She brought up how Southbound was her favorite gory movie. So we did her some fan service and actually watched that. And now we're going to talk about it today. So we're not going to dive right in yet because I want to find out how my favorite co-host is doing. Clark, how you doing, bud? Mm, I'm doing pretty okay. How about yourself, man? I'm doing pretty good. Back on paternity leave, chilling out, relaxing, maxing all cool, shooting some bebop upset of the school. Um, just kidding. I don't Hanging know what that's with... from. But it sounds um, like it's from a thing. Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Oh yeah, that is a show. Hanging out with the uh, the fam, man. Uh, wife and daughter are on summer break, so we're just kind of spending time together. Um, yeah. I feel like today of all days, I'm saying um a lot. I don't know why. Maybe I do it well, regularly. Um, like I think that's like totally okay and stuff, like for sure. Perfect. I'm gonna work on it. We can both work on it. I need to stop saying like. Mm, like we can okay. just fill, we can fill it with silence Beep. as we both improve Beep. our public speaking abilities. Every time so I say um, about. I'm going to bleep it out. You can't bleep it out. It'd just be full of bleeps, and everybody would be like, actually do it. It'd be funny. If you want to spend that much time and energy in a bleeping out ums, I'd say go for it. Otherwise, you know, there you go. I put a you know in there. Otherwise, you could just fill it out with dolphin noises or whales <laughs> or whatever you want. Let's jump into the film, though, because so I know me, we have a lot going on here yeah, that both of me, us want to discuss. Let me give you some details about the movie real quick before we start breaking apart the segments. Um, That's what I want to hear. Perfect. So we had eight directors working together and six different writers working together. The body count doesn't matter and the budget is nowhere to be found on the Internet. This is very much so like an indie film, although it is a horror anthology, so it's really five indie shorts put together, in my opinion, very well. Just to give you kind of like what the story is, in case you haven't watched this before uh, we were talking about it. It's five interlocking tales of terror, follow the fates of a group of weary travelers who confront their worst nightmares and darkest secrets over one long night on a desolate stretch of desert highway not everyone uh, is a traveler in the segments um there's one segment where where well, we can talk about that later but but well tell me tell me more about the director because i'm i'm interested because you said he was from vh he did vhs well so every I'm, everyone who worked I'm, together on this film is from vhs yeah i'm not familiar with that that movie series I, i've heard the name but i've never seen it Okay, so, so that's going to get added to the list for us to watch for sure, because I think it's before, a lot of fun. Before then, like, can you give me kind of... So this guy has has a bunch of fans, and this movie's probably... Like, you, from what you've said is this movie is pretty well known in the horror community, and I've never heard of it before. Yeah, so it's got a really good score um, on Rotten Tomatoes, and mm -hmm. out of, I think... I don't remember the number. It's on so a lot of streaming it. services too. It is. Free. So it's on Hulu for free, which is, <laughs> I've seen this movie now two and a half times since we decided we were going to watch it. Um, watched it on Hulu, watched it on Amazon Prime. And uh, every everywhere I look, 
when it comes to reviews, they're all good reviews. I don't see very many reviews that are upsetting or or uh, didn't like it. The Rotten Tomato score, like I said, was pretty high as 81%. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, that's only out of 51 reviews, but, I mean, you can look at some of the better films, and they they don't have a ton of reviews either, but they get good scores on Rotten Tomatoes or bad scores. So, Five, I think 51 is... IMDb. Yeah. So that was the other thing is IMDb's rating was a 5.9, which is fairly high for a horror anthology. That's when you rated compare. by, that's rated by the audience though. Uh, to Rotten Tomatoes does the, mainly does, critics, and then they have the popcorn score from the viewers. Yep. See, si, senor. So the point that I was talking about earlier with the VHS franchise is. This movie is actually produced by Brad Miska, who's the founder of Bloody Disgusting. And Bloody Disgusting okay. is the company that created the VHS franchise, a film called Under the Bed, another one called A Horrible Way to Die, and then the current film that we watched this week called Southbound. And they've distributed, uh, distributed that's a fun word to say, a bunch of films uh, when they partnered with AMC Networks and The Collective under a company named Bloody Disgusting Selects. So... The difference being these were films that were like specific genre released films to the theater, AMC theaters, and also direct to disc and on VOD platforms. Mm. So it's it's just like they pump, you know, did a big deal with AMC and the collective and then pumped out a bunch of films for them that uh, personally, I've never watched any on that list. But there's like, I don't know, 10 to 15 movies I saw on there on that list specifically. Okay. So Bloody Disgusting is a pretty big deal uh, when you think about the horror genre, especially um, if you follow different uh, like websites that you like to get your information from. Bloody Disgusting is one of the big ones that I get uh, different articles and, and I like to read stuff from. So, um, But the important piece here, I think, is that um, Bloody Disgusting, since they created VHS, All of the directors that we have here for these different segments work together to also make VHS, which was another anthology that got a lot of very good, I'd say, like popularity for a while. I would say just like any franchise, as it goes on, the less, you know, the less uh, happy people are with it. But it's really cool to see them all working together. Kind of moving away from the gushing. um, Is there anything like else? How much... Like, what else do we have on the information of this film before we kind of jump in to explaining, which I want to kind of get into as soon as possible? Yeah, so the the last thing that I found that was kind of neat was that the film did premiere at a film festival in Toronto mm-hmm. uh, back in it 2015. Never in theaters. Um, well, it then, after the film festival, it, it got a very, like, small release. It was, like, a limited release For in awards, February. Probably. probably. And then... Um, it, it did get listed on numerous best horror films of 2016, and that included the Rolling Stone list, the BuzzFeed list, and the Thrillist list. Yeah. So if you it's like... Almost, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's almost perfectly an hour and a half. Yeah. Almost perfectly. Yeah. And you could watch this in 30, 30 minute segments easily. Yeah, definitely. I mean, pretty sure the first night I watched it, I didn't realize even how fast like time had flown mm. by. Um, but I don't know. I, I think the pacing is decent enough and I think you could, you could figure out a way to chalk it up and, and pause it in good thirds for sure. Yeah. So, uh, well, the big reason why hot crack rap picked this movie for us though, was because it was one of her favorite movies with gore in it. Um, and I mean, yeah. just, just a note or something that you and I talked about previously is that we didn't really think it was that gory. Um, it's not. especially in comparison to some other films that, we consider to have more gore. One of your favorites is Terrifier. Yes. Terrifier for sure is a lot gorier than this. And I told you, I was like, that's as, I think it was in the last episode we did, we recorded. I, I said like terrifiers is as gory as I'll get. And even then you have like we, what you, what we were talking about, like evil dead. The remake is worse than this. This movie is not a gore fest film, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider it that there are movies where it's just like, tons and gallons and gallons of blood and people's body parts getting whacked off yes so that's wizard of gore which is the the movie that i want to do fan service to from the 70s so like if you haven't Mm -hmm. seen it or heard of it um and you like gore check out wizard of gore 
Um, the other movie that I feel has a, a lot better gore in it is The Green Inferno. So it's something a little bit more new, a little bit more modern um, and original. So I think those four films, when it comes to gore, have more of a gore factor than this film. But personally, the gore in this movie was enough for me to keep me hooked throughout. So um, enough fan service from me because um, I am gushing. I do like this movie a lot. I like mm -hmm. the people who are involved in it a lot. So obviously, um, I could talk for hours about that. But enough about that. Let's let's actually get into the movie itself and start talking and dissecting some of these segments. Um, and we're going to do it in order of the film, right? That's That's what we decided on? Yeah, yeah. And to be frank, we're going to try to avoid spoilers as much as we can until we reach the end for this this point, because it would kind of spoil the movie if we didn't do that. Like, we will spoil the movie for you at our, at our own pace, if that makes sense. Yes, we'll spoil it in order. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> All right, cool. So I have the names of the segments them. and who directed them. Um and then the main characters of the segments, if that helps us right. kind of remember what was happening. So we start the movie with the first segment. It's called The Way Out. Um, and this one was directed by Radio Silence. Um, and our two main characters that you meet are Jack Mitch and, and Mitch. Yep. Uh, Jack's an asshole and Mitch is the, uh, the everyman. Okay. I'm, I'm confused about this one still. Um, I rewatched this segment specifically this one because I didn't understand what happened by the end of it. And in this one, we have two guys who who look like hell. They're driving to a gas station, right? Mm -hmm. And they they go to this gas station, and the girls like paying customers only because they're going to the bathroom, or he's going to the bathroom. So the guy gives gets gas, and, and she's like, "Rough night." He he's kind of looks at her like, "Yeah, no shit." And his face is cut up, and he's like, "Yeah." And then he goes inside the. Um... Actually, you know what? This this scene makes more sense now. <laughs> well, the some of it makes more sense now. Sure. A lot of it doesn't. So he goes to the bathroom, and something pulls. He ta he's taking his shirt off, and he's checking his stomach where there's like a cut. Mm -hmm. And we, the viewers, we don't know where he got this cut. We don't have any any information. And watching this, I'm like, is, are they going to have a flashback? Or are we going to are we going to figure out what happened to them? Well, my first missing, time watching this, you're missing the big piece, in my opinion, is when they're first driving in, right? And the radio's playing, and it has that really creepy uh, DJ voice, um, and he's talking about how you're on the long road home or whatever, right? But, but Mitch he's is there in every mm -hmm. every segment has that guy. He's there to introduce the segment to you mm -hmm. and kind of he... give you like a clue as to what's going going to happen. While he's talking, Mitch is looking around and you can see these things hovering and you're not really mm -hmm. sure what they are, um, but they're kind of following the truck and Jack's not they paying attention. Like, Jack's just driving. They look like kind of Grim Reaper skeletons. It's it's pretty cool. Like I, they, I wanted to talk about those too, but... Yeah, I called them Reaper creatures. This is a perfect time to start talking about them because this is the first time we well, see them. I, I want to talk about like what happened in the bathroom before, okay. before that because there's a segment where... We get to see the Reaper in action. That's kind of so. Like when he's in the bathroom, we don't see anything, right? His shirt. You just see a gets flash pulled. in the mirror of the creature behind him. You do. Uh huh. And then when he then his puts his head down to like wipe his face off with his shirt, that's when the Reaper he... thing grabs the shirt. But you don't see. Well, the we Reaper. don't see it though. We see like the shirt fly backwards in his face, and he's like, "We gotta go." And he walks up to his friend Mitch, and he's like, "We gotta leave." Right. And then they start driving off. And that's when you see more of the Reaper creatures kind of everywhere. Mm -hmm. They all start and coming out of the woodworks. One of but I love it because the girl, the girl goes, come again soon. And she yeah. totally knew they weren't going anywhere. <laughs> like yeah. she totally knew it. Well, she's just out there out front, like smoking a cigarette. By the gas She's pumps. cast perfectly, by <laughs> the way. Her face, her demeanor, her acting is on point. I want to give a shout out to her. Heck Great yeah. job. I don't know her name. Um, but... Great job. I think it may have been Christina Pesek. I'm not sure. Was it Sutter? Yeah, it was Sutter. Um, yep. Yeah, that was what so, her name badge said. On point. On point. And as they're driving, they keep looping. Doesn't matter where they go, they always wind up at the gas station. 
and she's like, "Welcome back." Yeah, I thought that and... shot where where they pull up. Uh, so so they left right, and she mm -hmm. said, "Come again soon." They they drive off, and then they drive back up, and she she asks him again, "Rough night," um, mm -hmm. and then he's like, "What the fuck?" And then he drives off, and the camera doesn't change; like there is no cutaway. The truck drives off. It pans then back to her to Sutter, and then the truck pulls back up again, and he says it again. He's like, "What the f?" And then takes off again. I thought that that was really, I don't know, a really well done shot because obviously there's a bunch of movie magic you could do to get that, but you don't see like the clear cut. It almost looks like one shot, which I think by is the really way, neat. By the way, the uh, guy who plays Mitch is a, the actor and writer for Ready or Not, VHS, and Southbound. Yeah. Yes. So kind of, and that's, he's kind of the everyman character and Jack is the asshole. And Mitch and Jack, they kind of separate at this point. And Mitch is like, you can go ahead and leave, but I'm not going to try anymore. I'm not going to try. And Jack gets in the car. So that's Matt Bettinelli open, right? I, I can't pronounce it. It sounds like a, a French, weird French name. Because I'm pretty uh, sure that's Jack's character, yes. not Mitch's. Yes, that is him. Okay. He, <clears throat> He's also in all three of those movies. He's the director, I believe. Uh, <clears throat> he he gets killed by the this Grim Reaper character, this Grim Reaper creature, which kind of opens up like a little slowly, and it very briefly shows like a skeleton inside it, mm -hmm. which is really awesome design that I, I wanted to comment on. I I've never I don't know, like it just kind of splits open right in the center, and you see like a skull skeleton just very briefly inside it, and it screams, and it just murders the guy and when you think it's going to kill mitch it flies towards him just disappears yeah i i absolutely love the reaper creatures i thought they did really good um uh, especially for it being cgi obviously um there's not a lot of times where i'll see cgi stuff and be like oh man that looks phenomenal but the uh, these things these reaper creatures looked amazing also one of my favorite kills in the movie right here when he just reaches down in and pulls his soul right out of the guy it's like, like that was just it soul? So... what else is he reaching in there for i thought he just like ripped inside him and he just died i mean you put your hand down someone's mouth and you go into their body you're probably fishing for something a heart i don't know maybe i don't know i, I thought mean... he just murdered him yeah because, like his mouth's all torn up and there's a nice little skeleton Which is pretty troll. good gore no it's good uh it's good like the makeup's great when he's dead you see his face just like kind of cut yeah and masked out like the teeth? See portion of his uh, portions of his skull for people who don't like teeth it probably looks really good too yeah i uh i i personally think that this this is a very good so remember the theme of this episode is 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 gore so a lot of times in my notes i wrote down anything that had to do with gore I feel like this is really good gore to start the movie, but it was just too short. I would have loved to have seen a little I, bit more. I didn't really... To me, this felt... I don't know. Maybe it's R-rated gore? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a little desensitized, because like, when I think of gore, I think of what we see in the third the third story. But And we could talk about that, too. Oh, which, we'll, we'll get there. When Mitch goes to the... like, Mitch ends up at a hotel his character and he sees his daughter and she's, he just screams and nothing happens to Mitch. It just moves on to the next segment, which is in the hotel room next door where the way they segment it is the housekeeping lady puts a do not disturb sign on his door and just moves on to the next. And then the next main character kind of pops out. Yeah. So the, this is the segue from segment one to segment two. Mitch is left to lament over the inability to save his daughter um, and be there in her time of need. Whatever that means, we don't know still. We just know that every time he gets close to his daughter in that house, he gets popped back into the hallway. Uh, and it's, con it's this constant like torture, um, almost a mental torture of like he's never going to be able to get there and save her. I don't know much more than uh, that. Saver, I don't know. I thought it was just like he was doing something for his daughter because she was brought up by mm -hmm. Jack. Mm -hmm. And I don't, there's no context there. Exactly. And this is what I'm trying to tell you. Like, this is where I went mentally is like 
he's constantly if you if you watch him he's he's running around the house trying to get to her and he yeah. never gets there in time and she keeps screaming out daddy daddy save me daddy daddy save me and he can't get there he's unable to do whatever he was trying to do um and you also notice the reaper creature is in the living room watching this play out over and over mm. and over again um, so he's just being tortured ooh. while the other guy gets destroyed i just feel like he's in in that hotel forever to be tormented whatever it is whatever like he's is dealing hell? with uh not necessarily hell um but we'll get there not necessarily so hell. the next the next main character i think her name's sadie yes uh, she's played by fabian therese mm -hmm. and that she's also in john dies at the end oh okay um, which is probably one of my favorite movies that's on my watch list on netflix you should watch it it's highly recommended okay all right i'm glad to hear that someone i know has liked it and uh now i Dude, actually have a good I, to go the check books it out. The book's even better than the movie. The book's the movie's great, but the book's better, and the sequel's awesome too. There's spiders in this book. Ooh. So, yeah. so this segment with Sadie uh, is called Siren. Um, and note when the housekeeper is walking from his from Mitch's room and hangs the Do Not Disturb, she's humming and singing a little mm -hmm. tune. And then passes that room, and then that's when, like you said, Sadie comes out. She opens up the door, um, and man, are these girls hungover! Like, like they look like they had a a wicked time the night before, right? Well, Sadie's driving, so it's okay. <laughs> is she is she driving or is yeah. the blonde? I think Sadie's driving because Kim. Yeah. Is it Kim and Ava are are hanging out in the back? Well, Ava's the one who's super hungover, and she's mm -hmm. probably the stoner of the group, and Kim's just a bitch. I don't she's know. Your Kim's ob the one getting high on the bed. <laughs> yeah, she is getting high on the bed. You're right. But Hannah kind of acts like the stoner chick who's just kind of there for vibes, and Kim's just a massive work that I won't say. Sure. Uh, Ava seems like the younger sister of the group, the one that they yeah. kind of coddle and let have like fun and then they just like deal with her shittiness the next day. Like if she's super hungover and they just get her up and move her on and throw her in the back of the car, right? Like she's, she's the youngest. So they're going to give her a lot of reprieve because they just want her to have fun and not be um, tortured. But that's well, just, got, that's my opinion on it. Yeah. There's a lot of weird stuff with, with this segment. I, I don't know. Cause they're, what about Alice? Cause this girl named Alice is mentioned several times. Oh, Alex. I'm, Sorry. Alex or yeah. Alice? Because I heard Alice. Alex. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I, I had a re refresh. I had a rewind and I heard Alice. Um, But if it's Alex, that makes sense. Uh, let's see. So their car breaks down just to kind of speed through this and to get to where what matters. And then this weird couple kind of shows up and picks them up. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're kind of dressed up like they're in the 1950s. They're two... Ava and Kim are like, let's go in the car. Sadie's like, no, we no do that. Why bad? So Sadie's kind of like, this is weird. There's something off about this whole situation. And the other two girls are like, no, this is normal. We're going to keep doing this. So they go in the car and they make it to their house where the scene where the, the lady's like, take a bath, do whatever you need to do. We'll take care of you. And then she says, I'm sorry about Alex. And then she said, he's like, what did you say? And she says it so quick that you miss it the first time you watch this. Yeah. And I had to rewind it. And she's like, I'll get supper ready for us. Sadie's like, what did, wait, what did you just say? And then the mom responds. And she's like, no, no, no. Before that. Oh, oh, I'll go get supper ready for us. And you're just like, whoa, hold on. We don't even know about Alex. Like, how does this random lady that they just met know anything about their friend that clearly isn't here? something weird you know you're already getting kind of like a weird feeling about everything right then and there i don't understand what happens to to alex still like there there are things i just don't understand there's context missing in a lot of scenes in this film so kim explains it in a pretty bitchy way weird. after dinner yeah weird way we we understand that someone died and then it's blamed on well so kim blames her. sadie because sadie let I, alex leave that night i don't think Kim actually blames her. I think she's under the influences of that weird meat they ate. Yes, fair enough. So whatever, what what should we call them? Zombied 
Kim and Ava at this point. <laughs> well, so, they, so let's talk they about feed, the dinner table real quick. Cause... Let's talk about the dinner, please, because those <laughs> brothers, they kind of look the same. They kind of look like twins. They drink at the same time, but they're not twins. I <laughs> So they look really familiar to me. Uh, I don't see them on IMDb. Do you? Uh, did you look at the full cast? Yeah, and I'm trying to find their faces. So either they're a ca character without a face on INTV or or I'm just not recognizing The Kensington them. twins, Max and Nick Folkman, they're oh, actually brothers. So they are twins. Yeah. Or they're brothers for sure. I don't, don't know, know if they're, they're twins, twins, but they're brothers. Um... That's where they're from. Or that's where one of them's from. He's from The Purge. Okay. Man of Medan. Oh, so they're in Man of Medan too, which is a video game. Okay. So, uh, sorry. Don't mean to digress too far into them. Uh, but man, are they weird. Man, are they weird. Um, and they're yeah, drinking so they're their both milk. In, <laughs> they're both in Man of Medan. So, so they're, yeah, that weird, that weird liquid stuff that they all drink. Which was, uh, they said it was yogurt and milk. Hmm. Just so I believe that. Just so you know, just so you know the what medicine you know. that the medicine. Uh huh. They didn't. Well, I thought they were drinking orange juice at the dinner table, but maybe it was that weird stuff. I don't remember. I remember the meat though, which just kind of looked weird. And the girls really loved it, but Sadie's like, "I'm, I'm vegetarian," because she's, you know, she's the one that's weirded out by everything. Well, I mean, would you character. really? I mean, would you trust these people? The, no, but no, <laughs> honestly. Okay, so if somebody let me, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go into strangers' home in the first place. I'd be right. like, no, I'm gonna wait for, for help, or yeah. drive me into the next town. Please don't uh, do anything else. I mean, Sadie was right from the beginning. I guess is is my big feeling is like these three girls should not have taken the offer. Was she though? I think so. I think they should have just sat on that van, sat the van, and waited it out. But I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter based on what's going on here. They're Regardless kinda... of what happens, the girls eat the eat the meat. They mm -hmm. start vomiting up black crap everywhere, and that's when Kim's being a super bitch to Sadie, talking about it being all her fault that Alex died. And I don't really what context about Alex do we get because I okay, don't recall so, anything. Yeah, so so right before she's throwing up the black shit, she starts smoking a joint. Uh, Sadie's going through like the dresser drawers, and she finds like this weird stiletto knife hidden, right, which comes into play later on. Uh, but but when she's going through the people's drawers, uh, Kim Kim says some things that really shed light into the situation. It doesn't paint the perf perfect picture, but it tells you what happened, basically. So they were at a club, and Alex... She had sex. Well, Sadie wanted to hook up with some rando at the club. Alex wanted Sadie to leave. Sadie told Alex, why don't you just leave? I'm, you know, I'm going to go home with this guy or hang out with this guy or whatever. Because he had a Tempur-Pedic mattress. I don't know if those was, two stories are He was are 49. Related, but... 49 is not old. <laughs> those are no, two different no. stories. No, they no, no, they're the same story. This they happen is that at different times. Guy. No. No, it's the same guy. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, man. This is the guy with the Tempur-Pedic mattress. So anyways, when Alex leaves, that's the night that she died. Now, you don't know anything else, right? You don't know how she died exactly. Uh, you get kind of a hint that it was a car accident of some sort. And um, we'll explain that in a couple minutes, I think. Okay. Um, and you know that Sadie uh, has guilt. She has remorse because she feels like, yes, she could have saved Alex and Alex wouldn't have left kind of a thing. Okay. So that's Regardless the context we get. These girls are throwing up black shit. Just, yeah. Yep. Kim and Ava so, throwing up weird black shit. Get the medicine. Then... The medicine, which is the yogurt and the milk, and like there, everybody's just laughing it off. Oh, this happens, huh? First time, huh? Ha ha ha! Give them the give them the milk yogurt. And they and change then... their clothes, which I also it I I mean it oh, makes so sense perfect, though, because they're for like wives. <laughs> yeah, there's some like cultist thing going on here, but well, they join the cult <laughs> after this, and that's where Sadie just freaks out and she runs off onto the highway. Let's talk about the. Uh, the what is it the ritual though because i want to the prayer because at the dinner so the table prayer they at have the dinner that weird table. prayer yeah that is like threw me talking off. to the master their master their overlord thank you for these new 
uh, this new flesh to give to you or something weird like that. Yeah, this new, these new body or these new flesh, blood. Um, thank you for, you know, basically it sounds like he's that man. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he's thanking whoever they worship um, for these, these, th you know, three new bodies that they're mm -hmm. going to accept into their, into their household. Um, which is, is so weird because then Ava's like, amen. And all of them look at her like, no, 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 no. We're not praying to God. We're not praying to this God. <laughs> like, but they don't say anything. They just look at her like, mm -mm, amen is not the appropriate way to end this. Oh, they're the I... ones that said amen. No, they're not. Ava is not the people. Yeah, that's, that's what I said. Yeah. They, they, the girls were the ones who said amen, not anyone else. Well, yeah. So it's just, just Ava says it. The other girls are silent for whatever reason. They're not even... It's just weird. Kim's weird looking at the meat. But... Ava's looking at the meat. I, I'm almost curious... They enjoyed the meat. ...what they're trying to figure out there. Like what... I'm trying to figure out what cultist-type feel it is. It's probably some just general thing. You're not supposed... It doesn't matter, right? That's That's probably the truth behind it. But then the boys, the twins, they're like, I thought there was four of you. And then the mom bangs the table and she's like, enough. She kicks him. Yeah. From under the table. And she's like, enough. That's that's it. Were there supposed to be four of you? Yeah. And the girl's like, what? And the other girls don't even pay attention. No, because they're so already thinking, eating the meat. So my kind of my my theory at this point of watching this movie is this is this girl's hell. This is her hell. Um, Sadie's. Because she's the only yep. one weirded out. She's the only one going through everything. This is kind of like a fever dream for her. And the similar situation for the previous guy. But I honestly didn't know if he died or not when I first watched this. I kind of rewatched the first one. But when you go forward to the, the cult scene and they, they have like the ash on their heads and they're all praying around circling the fire and just saying a bunch of weird shit around it and Sadie gets caught in the bear trap. Yeah. Like that's what I'm like, this is really fucking weird. What's going to happen here? Yeah. I love, I love how they allude to those two items too, the bear trap and the switchblade, because when they get picked up, yeah. the girls notice the bear trap in the back and ask about it. And then, Coyote. She... Arr, arr, arr. <laughs> and then she finds this, uh, stiletto, uh, in the drawer. She takes it with her. Cause she has that nightmare about Alex. So that's the other piece before the ritual. Like Sadie has that nightmare about Alex um, getting hit by a car and then wakes up and the girls are gone and they're being taken to the ritual. Um, that's where I think we get, that's the only real like alluding we get to Alex being hit by a car, but we don't know. If, like I said, we still don't know for sure, but she gets caught be, in a uh... bear trap and uses the stiletto knife to get out of the, the bear trap, which I think was not realistic in my opinion. Um, and you just a plot a point. Of, need a lot of physical strength to open a bear trap. <laughs> yeah, or the pin, no. right, <laughs> to release it. I, um, I don't know. I've never, I've never opened a bear trap. I thought like it was spring loaded, so I don't know. Whatever it. happens, you know, the trapper gets her. She gets <laughs> out and she runs out in the street, which segues into Lucas's story. Yes, because he hits her with the car. Yep. Now, in all of these segments, I'm going to point out where the Reaper creatures are hanging out at the end. Because when okay. she gets hit by the car, behind her on the side of the road, where she came from, you can I see one of the Reaper creatures sitting there watching her as it, I as didn't it happens. Know they were in there. I didn't know they were in every single scene. Yes. And uh, when no we idea. get to the end, that's where I think it'll help kind of uh, elude and... and Kind of wrap everything together so we can understand what's going yeah. on. Well, let's more. talk about Lucas's because he's. I don't want to. I think we're we're kind of going in a little bit more detail than we should. Um, for that one, the first we did. The first sure. two are kind of. The second one it takes the longest, I think, and the most explanation. Yeah. So this, this one's, one's called the just accident. Kind of, this one's just kind of fucked up because Lucas is on the phone with his wife. He hangs up on her twice, <laughs> telling her he'll call her back. He calls nine one one. Talks to the paramedic. Paramedic tells him to move the body into the car. He finds a hospital, and the hospital's completely empty. And I hope that's okay. If, like, if I fast forward like that, keep going. You're doing great. So, 
in the hospital, it's like, he's like, there's nobody here. There's nobody here. And the dispatcher, uh, I, she, she does a great job kind of explaining things. And all of a sudden another person comes on the line. He's like, I'm the surgeon. You're going to have to operate on her. And he gives him like the steps and the advice on what to do. And he tells him to shove his hand inside her, her stomach to fix a rib to compress and the he, lung. Yeah. So he ends up killing her. Yeah. And they're like, you can just leave Lucas. Well, and there's like a bunch yeah, of so... weird, creepy laughter with like three different voices. You got three people. You got the dispatch who, who gets him to this town, this random ass yeah. town to a random ass hospital that has nobody inside of it. And this is where it all starts to go wrong. So these three people are all plotting together to get him to go in there and save, and I'm air quoting, save her life. It's actually a trap. Like they trapped Lucas there and they walked him through basically how to kill Sadie, not save her. And they're, and I like, I can't even describe that kind of a feeling that Lucas must be going through because he's the whole time he's like, what do I do? What do I do? And they're like walking him through her leg, like breaks the leg falls off. and it's basically falling off the side of the table. He's trying well, to like, fall off. he's trying. Yeah. The jeans are the only thing holding it together. Um, and they're trying to like, he's trying to save her life, right? He has to shove his fingers down her throat, open up her airway, shove a hose in. Then, you know, he's, so he's, he did that. And then they're like, no, nah, it's not enough. Help her breathe. Yeah. And, and then, then the surgeon gets on the line and he's like, okay, she's got, you know, nine cracked ribs and she's having trouble breathing. You're going to need to compress her lung, uh, to, to help her breathe again. So he taught, he walks Lucas through how to cut the incision. And this, the reason why I want a little bit more detail about this part is because this is the most gore you really get in this entire film. And I, I yeah. thought personally, like this was the best gore in the movie. Well, that's um, where he puts his hand inside her. Yeah. Well, he oh. puts his hand inside, but when it's inside, you kind of see his hand and the blood. And like at that point, I'm like, okay. Like the hand Especially goes disbelief. all the way up though, also to the elbow, which I feel like if, her, if it's her lung, he didn't have, I don't think he had to go that far up either. You know, well, um, he, I don't know about the size of the lung. I'm not a bio. I'm not, I'm not into the human biology. All I know sure. is that he murders her. And then he's like, so the then they happened? start, like, they start laughing. They, on the they phone. start laughing at him and he drops the ear head earbuds in her yep. blood. Yep. And he leaves. Cause he's freaking the fuck out. Yeah. So he's trying to leave, right? He's trying to get but the no, hell out of there. Not yet. Not yet. He runs back to the earbuds, though. He puts them back in, and he's like, what, well, he runs what do I do? runs to the door and finds out the door's locked, so he's trapped. Yeah. That's that's my big piece. Like, he has been trapped. Someone set him up. Not not with the okay. girl, but with getting to the hospital, because it's chained. You can't get out. The door that he went into is now locked from the inside. He can't get outside. And these voices are mocking him. So they basically make Lucas talk about what happened, and then he states his case. He's like, I don't deserve this. Like, this was an accident. It was dark, whatever. And then they're like, okay, Lucas, you're right. You can leave. You can leave. You can leave. Well, they're, the laughter is what I was focusing on. So he puts the earbuds in. He picks them off the blood. He puts these bloody earbuds back in his, his ears. And he's like, oh, this is all my fault. And he's freaking the fuck out. And rightfully so. And they're like, you can just leave. He's like, what? I can? Like, yeah, fuck it. And he, his car, his car's in perfect condition when he gets out, right? No. So they give him a new, fresh set of clothes in a locker, and he yeah. washes up, gets clean. And when he walks out, his car is there, dismantled. But he goes to hit his button, and then there is a new car that looks exactly it's, like his car, completely with clean, with no issues. Everything the same. Yeah. And they everything let him know the they exact same. they let him know like there will be no trace that you were ever here. Basically, these three demons that were tormenting whatever. him well i mean i'm i i'm this is if, my if, interpretation yeah right these three demons who were tormenting him um realize that lucas hasn't done anything wrong he he's you know he tried to save the life it was an accident whatever so they let him go and they give him a and car he and he drives off and yeah that's weird yes but i don't know if he ever actually leaves and we can get back we'll get there that later. yeah yeah so um, when lucas leaves Another Reaper creature is floating outside the hospital watching him as he drives off. I remember that. Was this like, did it close up on it? Was it, was no, there a close up? No, you see up, it as he's driving to... away. You see it in the, 
like if you look through the back window because you're looking at him, right? So you so have to kind of him. pay attention to see these Oh, things. definitely. Oh, yeah. So that's okay. I didn't I don't look for anything like that. Um, well, I've and, seen and it two and a half times. I hope I see some things I didn't see the first one and a half. <laughs> well, then we transition into the person on the phone with him. Yes. Um, I think Bunny. Is that her name? I think that's her. Yeah. Bunny Kensington. I have Sandy the dispatcher, but I feel like Sandy's wrong. I think it's, well, it's Bunny. The, well, it's phony. No, no, no. Bunny is not the dispatcher. She's the phone operator. She's, I don't think it's, yeah, I think it is Bunny. Bunny's in the bar scene, right? Yes. She, she, she's not talking on the phone, but she's on the phone. It transitions she's the, onto her. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yep. She, and she goes to the bar. She says, good night, Lucas, she, and then hangs up. Yeah, so Lucas she goes is driving the, off, and she heads into the bar. Yeah, <laughs> this so bar good. scene is probably one of my favorite scenes um, in the film. But okay, she gets a beer. There's some weird conversation between her and the big guy, and this guy with a shotgun appears, looking for his sister. Yes. So this segment is entitled "Jailbreak." Yeah. Uh, Patrick Horvath is the one who directed it, and he did the pack two, which uh, everybody hates. So. Uh, this is actually my least favorite segment, personally. Really? Yeah. So, um, if you want to... The scene in the bar is what I liked. Yeah, it was all right. <laughs> oh, that was great. Because the big, the big guy, he's he's my favorite character so far. He's okay. like, hold, hold on there, little buddy. I know we seem like dumb country folk, but you best be careful. And he ends up, like, shooting his hand off and, like, black goops, like, squirting out of him. And he screams, like, this monster scream. And I'm like, oh, shit, that's rad. And the eyes. Oof. Yeah, and the eyes. Like, you can't tell me this is an okay scene. This is a great scene. I just, I didn't I mean, like it because it's just, um, yeah, I didn't I didn't like the acting in it. I felt it was very just poorly done. Uh, I didn't, that's just my so opinion. So, after the, after the bar, I, I would agree with you, but during the whole bar, I thought it was very well done. Like, just a bunch I, of I mean, the argument... <laughs> The argument about the door, the door's open. No, it's not. I closed it. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. That was sure. just for you to lower your guard for the bar. That was for you to lower your, your, lower your guard. You're supposed to take the side of these country bumpkins because a guy comes in with a gun. Mm -hmm. and he's like, I'm looking for this girl. And at that point, they're, they're sowing discord in your mind. It's like, well, whose side am I on? Oh, this guy I like. This guy who seems so down to earth. He's a monster? Holy shit. And it kind of made me question like, who are they trying to make the villain out to be? You so know, at the end they... of the segment, who do you think the villain is the country oh, bumpkins my... or Danny? I don't think anyone is frankly, but uh, I feel they, they, they messed it up and I wanted to get into that before you asked me that question. They messed it up <laughs> when he took the bartender hostage. Okay. Cause he, he takes the bartender hostage with his shotgun and the bartender takes him to the ice cream joint and, you know, this tattoo lets him see with his third eye or some weird shit where he finds the door on the wall to mm -hmm. find his sister. And at that point, I'm like, OK, so so now they're just doing this guy's a bad guy. I would have rather had it be a bit more ambiguous. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, this the whole story just seems kind of boring to me. The whole the whole segment. Um, Danny trying to find his it, sister. He's been looking for her for thirteen years. Yada yada yada. It loses it loses its its case right after the bar. Um, he finds his sister, and she obviously doesn't want to leave. And then he he gets his sister. He puts her in his car. And she, and, and I know you don't like it, but I don't, I don't want to paint the picture for our audience that this is garbage because I want them to kind of get their own opinion too. But when he, he goes there, she's like doing tattoos. Mm -hmm. And the other guy just starts beating the crap out of him. The guy he took hostage is like, okay. And she's like, stop, stop. Don't beat him up. Oh no. She get, gets in the car with the guy. And she's like, I don't want to leave. The guy gets pulled out by like, these guys in white powder, naked guys wearing a bunch of white powder, and they just start beating the shit out of him or eating him or whatever. Well, so Al alludes the to The lady him, dries off. Like before that, when they're driving to that ice cream store, he tells him, he goes, 
because because Jesse or Danny's looking out the window at the desert and Al says it looks like the desert but if you go out there you might not come back like he's letting him know like it's not safe out there don't go out there then Danny finds his sister at the tattoo parlor the secret door inside of the ice cream shop he's um, aged she hasn't exactly come to find out you know whatever's going on here Jesse hasn't aged much Danny's gotten a lot older gets into a fight with Al, blows off his head, which I thought was pretty cool as well. The head the head explosion was pretty neat. Um, and then, so that's when Danny drives out into the desert and Jesse tells him not to, but he doesn't listen. And she goes, if you do this, this is for you. This isn't for me. And then he does it anyways. Uh, and then Jesse also tells him that she's the one who killed their parents when they were kids and that she's meant she to be she where she is. She said she enjoyed it. Yeah. She she's enjoyed like, killing him. This place was built for people like me. Um, and then that's when the demons pull Danny out of the car and Jesse drives away, leaving there to be torn apart. I think they're just naked guys in white, white powder. They're just very high on, high on a lot of meth. Yeah, they're really... demons, for sure. It's been clarified. No, man, they're, they're meth heads. <laughs> let, let me have my theories too, Curtis. <laughs> these aren't theories, though. These are the actual... Shit on my parade. You're a parade pooper. That's this what you is, are. This is the writing, though. Like, it's I don't care what written. the writing is. <laughs> Look, I'm allowed to have fan theories. I don't need to hear it. They're all meth heads. They're all, they all ate a bunch of powdered donuts. All the powder got all over their naked bodies, and they decided to just kind of kind of slap around a guy on the ground because there's, like, no gore, just a guy getting slapped by a bunch of naked guys. <laughs> and then his sister drives off. Okay. We'll let you have fun with that. <laughs> it's, I, think it's, I think it's way more fun than <laughs> it's just like, okay, it's a bunch of... Guy, it's just a bunch of naked guys in white powder. That's like all it is. I would have liked it better if they they kind of made them look a little bit scarier, as opposed to just you know, talcum baby powder. Which we kind of segue the girl drives back to the ice cream parlor where we see our next main quote unquote main character. Well, and the Reaper creature is floating above in the moonlight when the meth heads okay. are killing danny the meth heads they're, they're demons curtis Jeez, you and your crazy meth heads. i was told by someone that they're meth heads <laughs> i <laughs> covered, don't know who would tell covered you that. in white powdered donuts <laughs> who, would tell, who would tell you that <laughs> uh which the picture is funny <laughs> the picture they are i mean that is probably the worst if i'm being honest that is probably the worst looking uh characters i think in the segments is those weird looking whatever they are we'll just say whatever they are out there in the desert they i just don't i don't like the way those character design looked at all they looked weird but yeah so like you said the segue is from jesse is heading back to her secret door holding her hand over her eye and that's when um our next character from the segment the way in uh her name is jem she's well, exiting she's the bathroom her, she's like what are you looking at bitch or something yep. like that and then she's like, you know what? I'm not going to deal with this. And heads back to sit down with her parents and have dinner. Uh, yeah, her parents are so Kate and Daryl. Just to be I want to talk about the, the, this family after we, we finish this one. Okay. So we're going to walk through the segment real quick. And then you want to talk about the family? Yeah. Okay. So the family's getting ready for dinner. Uh, some strange knocking happening on the door. Three, went, uh, three men wearing masks then invade the home. I get a very, like, the strangers feeling uh, during this scene at first. And then, uh, and then so we get a couple of things that happen here plot-wise that are important. Uh, one of the men whispers to Kate, the wife, um, and, and she's, like, completely surprised by it that whatever they said, Daryl's, like, you know, to her now, Daryl looks like this bad guy, right? So we don't know mm -hmm. what he whispered to her. Um, Just because Daryl is bad guy does not make Daryl bad guy. <laughs> And then the man smothers Kate with a T-shirt, puts it, shoves it down her throat, and kills her by smothering her with a T-shirt. Um, uh -huh. And then Jem hurts that intruder uh, outside the front door with a pair of scissors and a baseball bat. And then the two gentlemen who are not hurt let her go, tell her to leave. And then they go back inside, um, and Daryl <laughs> thanks them for saving his daughter. And then that's when uh, they go to kill. We let you go. Then, we let you go. And then this is when they go to kill the dad. And that's when 
Uh, one of our mass assailants pulls out the picture of a daughter, which at this point you should remember it's Mitch because that's the same picture he's holding from the first segment that we see uh, when he's in the hotel room trapped in that mm -hmm. hallway. Um, so by this point, I had already realized that this was Jack and Mitch because um, mm -hmm. you could pretty same. much tell the mask wasn't that. Uh, Memorable you know. faces. Yep. Well, in the mask, even when they had the masks on, I could tell who it was because they have this very the obvious body size. And well, I didn't even pay attention to that. <laughs> so then Jem comes back in and tries to get revenge on the intruders for killing her parents, which I realize is actually not correct because she hadn't seen her parents were dead yet. She attacks Jack uh, and stabs him with the wine bottle opener, and that's the wound that Jack has in the bathroom at the beginning of the movie, if you remember. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when Jem's running out, she sees that both of her parents are dead, freaks out, runs down the hallway. And this is where I don't know if you're going to be on the same page with me because I'm curious to hear your opinion as well. But their intention was never to kill her, only the parents. When Jem's running down the hallway, she accidentally runs into Mitch, who's coming around the corner at the same time, stabs her, and ends up killing her. Like, to me... Mitch did that by accident. He didn't mean to kill Jem. He was trying to grab her and catch her. Or he was just coming back in. I don't really know how it happened because he just looked so shocked when it happened. Like yeah. His face looked almost disgusted. Like he didn't mean to do that. Right? I don't know if you Better got that he, same feeling. He did it in self-defense and he's disgusted with himself. Yeah. So after that happens, he's like, we screwed up. You know, we messed up big time. And then the Reaper creatures start coming out of the bodies. Well, let's, let's <laughs> talk about what, well, how this happens because tentacles come from underneath them. They just kind of open up the ground. And like we see these bodies, these things pierce from the bodies and kind of just pull out from underneath them. And I don't know if they're coming from the bodies or if they're coming from underground and using the bodies as kind of portals because this is pretty cool. Um, like these tentacles kind of like buzz out from underneath and then he's kind of like, and this is where you get a nice, clear view of what's inside these things. Mm -hmm. They're opening up and closing a whole lot. Yep. What do you want to talk about? I don't know. Like, this is where they, the guys run out. One of the guys is dead, and then the other two kind of drive off. And that's where they, they say, and that's where it shows up as everything's kind of looping, right? Yeah, so Jack and Mitch end right where the movie began. Um, right. They go into the diner again, the diner slash gas station, and Mitch goes to use the bathroom. Jack then gets told, you know, got to be a customer, goes over, and she says, rough night, and then movie. Put a pin on that. Yep. Um, what I want to talk about are the, the family. Are they, are they in cahoots with the creatures throughout the movie? Are they these demon creatures? I don't know. That's my question. Yeah. Now, my theory is yes. Okay. Because that's where they, they just kind of pop out. And this whole time, they've always been part of these this this group or whatever. I don't know what this guy did, but whatever situation there, I feel it was just some sort of drama to get you to take the side of this family. And once so, the creatures kind of pop out of them, it's like, oh. So I think it makes sense because and – and here's why. So – when the dad and the mom are talking with or uh, talking at dinner, they're like, you know, she's getting ready to they never say what she's, you know, going to do. They're like, this is our last, you know, day together or whatever. They never say she's going to college. They never say she's going to, you know, back to school or they don't they don't specifically say what she's going to do, but they hope that she's ready for it, that she's prepared and that she for can death. well, or or to be a reaper creature, whatever that is. And to do a some sort of flying arbinger of Maybe. death. Yeah. I mean, that's a that's a really good... If they are, in fact, if this family is these creature things, and when they die, they become, you know, they actually become this, and she was of age or whatever. I don't know. I mean, that's even more further alluding, I guess, and in, in guessing. But, yeah, I mean, that would make more sense to me that they're definitely tied somehow to those things. Um hmm. Yeah, I mean, when I watched it, it looked to me like the body split open and they came out of the bodies, but you're right. I mean, it could have come from underground and then split through the body because there's the one that comes out by the truck out front that just comes out of a hole in the ground. 
There's no mm. body there, so it didn't come from anywhere. But that one also could have already been born, and it was coming to save the ones who just got born. I don't know. There's a lot so, to imagine there. I don't know what the directors or the writers or what the intention of this film was. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there was a clear direction other than this just being an anthology that loosely ties everything together. Uh, maybe not loosely. Tries to connect everything in some way, shape, or form. But it's it's not cohesive. Um, <clears throat> the only thing, well, it is cohesive. It's just not super cohesive and easy to understand. I don't think it's. I don't think there's anything solid behind it. I think it was just made to be fun and have some cool connections to keep you awake and thinking about it. And the whole looping aspect of this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. But wait, we're back at the beginning. Um, things like that always. It's done so much now that I don't. I don't really know what to think. I don't know if I like this movie. I don't know if I dislike it. I, I think, I think it's good watching. I think I'll watch it twice. Like I'll watch it again. But I don't. And and this is where I told you not to tell me. Like I don't know what what they meant to do with this film. Like what was their intent? So are you ready to hear what their intent was? I am ready. Okay. So, their idea is that these characters are all trapped in purgatory and they're that paying makes sense. and they're paying for their sins that they committed while living on an infinite loop. Um so that's why I kept kind of referring to their regret or their remorse for what they did. So if we walk through you can walk through each segment if you wanted to and and you know, listen back to what I said about where they had remorse or what they were feeling. The only one that is weird to me is still number three. It's the jailbreak Lucas. one. No, uh, sorry. No, number four. Lucas makes sense. Um, they let him go. Well, they did, but they didn't. Like, So the idea yeah. is that based on his decision, he will have to do it again if he didn't do it correctly. He did it correctly. They let him go. So he's now out of purgatory. He gets to pass on past purgatory. He Whereas, did it correctly because he tried to save her? Correct. And probably when he actually hit her in real life and killed whoever she was, maybe Alex, maybe someone else, that's never really told, right? We don't know how everyone got here. But he probably just went home. He went to his wife and he tried to cover it up maybe. Or maybe he was drunk driving and died and that was his problem. And this they gave him another chance to fix it. Who knows? But he's the only one out of all of these that they said, okay, you can leave now. And he actually drives off and gets to leave. But what um, about Mitch? So Mitch, the problem with Mitch is he's dealing with remorse and regret and can't get over it. He decided uh -huh. to go and kill another family in segment five. That's what gets him stuck in that loop. And until he chooses not to go and get his revenge, he's probably stuck there. So the, oh. the torment and that constant loop that he's stuck in is probably paying for that sin of killing someone instead of deciding not to. And that's only I can I'd think like of there. to think that Mitch. So if the, if this movie truly is a loop, then none of them break out of it would be my theory. Like they let him go, but he's still going to relive it over and over again. Yes. Infinitely. So the only loop that we know of for sure is Jack and Mitch. Cause the other three I segments, would... you don't get to see their official loop. You only get to see the full circle of one and five. I would say all of them are full circle. I would say this entire film's a full circle. I would say none of them got out. None of them. They're all stuck in it. Fair enough. If that's the case. I mean, I assume um, Lucas got <clears throat> out just based on his story. I would say he didn't because that he still did wrong in my eyes. He still left. He's still like, maybe he let it go and that may have been the director's perspective. But if this movie is meant to be a loop, then he's still going through the same thing and making the same choices yeah. over and over again. Yeah, totally. I could see that. I don't know. This movie's... Okay. I don't... It, it's it's something... Now that I have the, the purgatory thing, I'll watch it, I'll watch it again and I'll go like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I like that they kind of put in some eye candy like things randomly in the background. Did you look this up before you saw them or did you see them on your own? So everything I've talked about already, I've seen on my own. Everything that look? I have listed here, like, so I have Easter eggs still that I haven't discussed, and I have um, some fun facts and trivia about the way in and the way out. 
that we can mm -hmm. go into if we want to, if we have enough time. Um, but everything else, the first time I watched the movie, I just watched it. Um, took notes, interesting things that I found throughout it, like the creature that I liked, the gore, what, what segments I liked, what segments I didn't like. And then like seeing the Reapers, I didn't see until the second time, full time I watched it. And then I was like, oh crap, look, you know, there's that one. And then the next segment and I was like, okay, there's no Reapers here. How do the Reapers matter? And then sure enough, at the end of the segment, you see it. Standing. How did you, how did you notice them? Did you, were you just kind of looking for them or? Yeah. I mean, so when you watch a movie one time, usually mm -hmm. focused on the main character. Oh, when it's I, your second time. Gotcha. When I watch the movie, yeah. Whenever I watch a movie a second time, I'm, my eyes start to drift around and look around to see what else is going on because I've already seen the first view. Now I want a different angle. I want to see something a little bit different, which is why a lot of these movies that we talk about, I tend to watch more than one time before we actually record just because I want to see the movie multiple times. If I've, it's something like Scream that we did a couple weeks back, I mean, I've seen that movie so many times. I don't know if I need to watch it more than, I don't even think I need to watch it once and we could do a whole episode right now. Um, but yeah, so I, I do have some Easter eggs, uh, that we can get into the, the fun facts about the way in way out stuff is just, it's like some kind of cool stuff. Like you could see the truck from the way out visible in freezing over the ice cream parking lot at the beginning of the mm -hmm. way in. So like, if you're looking for those things, right, you could see the truck sitting there in the parking lot before we even really get started. But mm. so there's a bunch of facts about um, the way in and the way out, because that's like the two main segments that loop. So people have dissected the crap out of that. And I, I mean, it's insane how much stuff they have. But there are some Easter eggs that I think you might find fun. I'm not sure if you saw. I didn't see them. Um, so if you want me to go over those, we can. Uh, if you want me to ask some of my questions, like I'm still curious what your favorite segment, least favorite segment, and which segment you felt was the gorest, goriest segments. If you have answers to those questions, I'd love to get that from you. Okay. So what do you want to uh, do first, questions or Easter eggs? Up to you, man. Okay, so I'll just, I'll ask you the questions and then we'll go into the Easter eggs. Okay. So which which was your favorite segment? The first one, hands down. Okay. Which was your least favorite segment? Um, I would say the fourth one. The fourth one. Okay. So the fourth one was jailbreak, though. I thought you like. Oh, you like the bar scene, not yeah. necessarily the whole segment. Okay. Yeah. And then which segment do you think had the uh, best gore in it? Best gore? That's such a terrible... <laughs> I, I thought the goriest one, the one that had the most uh, gory practical effects, was the the third one. Okay. With the uh, hand in the, the chest cavity and the leg falling off. Perfect. Yeah. And the leg kind of bending outward when he picked her up. Yeah, so I liked the accident the most, which was the third one. My least favorite was jailbreak, uh, similar to you. And then goriest, in my opinion, was the accident as well because of the same, same exact reasons. The, you know. the only reason I thought jailbreak was the worst was because of the brother and sister combination. I thought the I'm looking for you and then her sister just being like super non. There, there was no emotion behind it. No, I, I mean, I can totally agree with you. And I think that's why I don't like that segment as a whole and why it actually. Was, Go ahead. Actually, you know what? No, I'm gonna have to re rethink that now. Now that I know it's purgatory, because she's saying like this is because of you. I feel like that segment explains the purgatory better than any of the other ones. Yes, he won't let go. Which I think is why they so slapped I, it in the middle. I don't think it's the worst one. If that's the case, I would have to say the last is probably the worst one. Because I don't like the fa the family's just kind of there. Just yeah, we don't get enough information on the family. That's for sure. I don't. I don't think they're. I think they're just there as a as a means to drive the beginning. So I had these questions laid out before I explained, in my notes at least, in the order of my notes. I was going to ask mm. these questions before the explanation of purgatory, but I like to hear your opinion on both sides. So, if you didn't know it was revolving around a purgatory esque theme, jailbreak would be would be your least favorite. Um, Knowing that it is revolving around purgatory, 
it's not your least favorite. The last segment with the family is your least favorite. I mean, that may, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. I, I would say, you know, I might have to really say the second one's probably the most disturbing one in terms of a standalone segment. That's one's the best out of the anthology. Yeah, uh, I've, but with, I'm just with not the last one the tying, <laughs> with the last one tying into the first one, and the first one kind of starting the way it does, it really pulls you into the film. And it makes you, uh, it invests you in such a way. And yeah. then when it, when you start to realize it's an anthology, then you're like, oh, okay. I, don't, I know you may not like the cult thing, but I, I feel like it's... Well no, done. I just, I don't understand it. You know what I mean? There's too many questions yeah. that I ask myself, similar to the family in five. Like, I want to know more about the family. I actually want to mm -hmm. know what that guy has to do with his daughter. Was she sick and he was the doctor and Mitch couldn't save the girl because she was sick? And the doctor couldn't save her, so now he's taking the revenge out on the doctor. That's one possibility. But there's just way too many, I guess, I universe universes that you could go into and try and figure out what was wrong with Mitch's daughter and why is that guy at I fault. I think the, motiv the motivation is less important than the act. And whatever the, in my, my opinion at this point, because they're not going to give you that. And even if they yeah. had it, which they don't, they just, this is a film, this was made, they're, they're, they're not going to have a whole bunch of backstory. If they did, that would kind of ruin the allure of the everything going on. But at the same time, there's not enough explanation to really give it anything that's, I can't really define it. The, the last segment just, in my eyes, is just why, what's going on. I don't, I don't understand the reasoning behind it. We know these guys are invading a home. We know they're going to murder these two people. I don't know why. Uh, we find out that in the first segment that it was done because of this guy's daughter. And Jack is in the same... I, I don't know if both... Is, is it Jack and Mitch? Are both of them in purgatory or is it just Mitch? All characters. Even, even that All family characters. is in purgatory. Everyone's in purgatory. I, I mean, when it said, yeah, the way that the way that they wrote it, right? The idea is that these characters are trapped in purgatory. These doesn't tell you who, so it just leaves it open. I in my probably it, the main characters. Main, maybe all, maybe yeah. But that's the thing is like Jack and Mitch are both main characters, so they're both trapped in pur trapped in purgatory. Is Jack in purgatory with Mitch because he's the one who told Mitch to let's go do this thing? And then the third guy, like the third guy's not even mentioned. <laughs> they're, you know, their third buddy. He doesn't need to be. No, he doesn't. But is he trapped in purgatory? I don't know. Yeah. Well, you have a lot of people marked as like lost souls. Um, which I think those are the naked people. Yeah, most likely. Lost souls. That's a that's a nice name for, for the naked creatures yeah. tattoo patron tattoo the, man the ones out in the desert that are lost not necessarily the demons or the because the like that's the other thing is they in that jailbreak uh episode or segment um they're specifically those patrons the bar patrons mm -hmm. are demons that was the idea for them and then um even the bartender is a demon so yeah, that's that's why I called them demons. Um, but they're technically the ones that shred Danny are lost souls. Okay, well, I mean, we got more than enough content here for an episode, that's for sure. But yeah, that's that's pretty much. I mean, I I really enjoy this movie. I could I could probably watch this movie quite a bit. Mm. Um, personally, I I just want to send another shout out before we start plugging things and um, talking about what we did or what we've been up to. Um, but yeah, thank you, Hot Crack Rat, for suggesting us to watch this movie. I really found it to be a lot of fun. Um, it sounds like Clark had some fun. We are going to transition now into our next part of the show, which is to talk about what we've been up to lately. And honestly, I don't have a whole lot for you. Um, personally, I've just been going through a lot of the old Shutter catalog, so... Um, they're adding stuff. It almost feels like every single week, uh, every other day, and yeah, they're just adding a lot of cool, fun stuff on there. So give it a give it a check, check it out. What have uh, What have you been up to lately? Uh, 
man, that's a terrible question that I don't want to answer. I don't know. <laughs> I've been playing Persona. Persona. I, I, I have too many video games, and, and it's 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 my it's my addiction. I, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm not drinking. I'm not smoking. So I've been playing a lot of Persona 4 Golden, and it's fun. It came out on PC recently. It's a Japanese RPG. Uh, if you want my weeb side to come out, it's the psychology. There's always a psychological theme in the Persona games. And the focus is facing your inner demons. And this one, like the side of you that you don't want to admit you have, which it's true that we all kind of do. Not everyone. Very Like the main character himself is an open book, but all the other characters, like one of them... There's it kind of peers into his sexuality and his rejection of of it of his internal monologue, which I think is pretty interesting. So if you're into uh, games that are heavy heavy on dialogue and lots of micromanaging, it's a it's a good one in terms of things to kind of think about. There's a murder mystery underneath it, but the the thing I really like is just watching the characters deal with themselves. And what they have working underneath them. I think I watched someone play Persona Five. Mm -hmm. uh, that on one's Twitch. that one's focusing on your inner rebel. Okay. But yeah, Persona Five is good too. Probably cool. the better game. Cool. All right. Uh, well, time to plug our social media and then uh, bid you all adieu. Hmm. So. If you want, and if you aren't already currently, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the number two guys horror pod. Uh, once again, that's the number two guys horror pod. And if you want to send us an email for a suggestion, just like Hot Crack Rat did um, via Twitter, uh, please do. But you can also send us emails at Gmail, two guys and some horror. That's all spelled out two guys and some horror at gmail.com. Um, yeah, we definitely uh, like getting suggestions from friends, family, uh, any of you guys out there on social media, uh, and we appreciate that you guys are listening. So I just want to say thank you. We look forward to uh, next week's surprise movie. Mm -hmm. GG. <laughs> Bye, guys.